Hey everyone, Mr. Dickin here, and in this video we're going to be talking about probability and the difference between theoretical versus experimental probability. Probability, again, is the likeliness that something will occur. All right, so let's get into first experimental probability. Experimental probability is what happens when we actually run an experiment. All right, so we're looking for the number of successful outcomes versus the number of attempts that we had. All right, the number of successful outcomes versus the number of attempts that we had. So if we're trying to find the experimental probability of flipping a coin and seeing how many times it lands tails, if we flipped a coin 30 times, you know, maybe 20 of those 30 would land tails because tails never fails. That would be my experimental probability. Now, theoretical probability is probably what we're most used to. Theoretical probability is what should happen in theory. So if I'm flipping a coin, in theory, 15 times should be heads, 15 times should be tails. However, if I were to run an experiment and flip a coin 30 times, that's not guaranteed to happen. However many possible outcomes we have, that's what's referred to as a sample space. So that's going to be representative of the total possible outcomes. Now down here in red, we have a little blurb and it says, as the amount of trials increases, the experimental probability, it's closer to the theoretical probability. And what that means is if I flip a coin, let's say 10 times, in theory, half of those times should be heads, half should be tails. That's not necessarily guaranteed to happen, right? I might get three and seven, or I might get two and eight. But if I were to flip a coin 10,000 times, the ratio of tails or heads to the total should get closer and closer to that half and half relationship. All right, so here we have theoretical probability of rolling two six-sided die. All right, so we have the outcomes for die one and the outcomes for die two. These numbers here represent the total. If we're trying to figure out what is the most likely outcome, we need to go through and figure out you know, how many times does a sum of two occur? And it looks like that only happens once. Or how many times do I get a sum of three? There's only two situations in which that happens. I've got three different scenarios in which a four could happen. I've got four different scenarios in which I could get a five. So there's all these different combinations. And as we look through this, in theory, the most likely numbers that we'd have would be six, seven, and eight. Because out of the total 36 combinations here, a six shows up five different times, a seven shows up six different times, and an eight shows up, again, five different times. So an eight and a six are equally as likely, in theory, to get. All right, let's get some examples here. In class, we tossed coins and recorded 161 heads, 179 tails. So for heads, we have 161. For tails, we have 179. Now that means we can figure out the overall total as well. If we just add those together, we'd get 340. So if I wanted the experimental probability of getting heads or getting tails, I would write that as probability of, of flipping heads would be 161 out of the total 340. Similarly for tails, the probability of flipping tails would be 179 over that 340. Now, the problem is asking me to go through and write these as decimals. And right now I have them as fractions. Personally, I'd actually prefer fractions. However, decimals can be easier to interpret sometimes because the closer something is to 50 or 0 0.5, then the more you know, equally likely something is. So this is just straight into our calculators. We're dividing these out. We'd get 0.473, or you could round that up to a 4. So about 47% of the time for one, and for the other would be about 526, so about 53% of the time. A little quick check sheet that we could do. If you add those together, it should be about 1. And I say about because you might get 0.99, you might get 1.001, depending on how you rounded. 
All right, next up, we have a class rolling a six-sided die. What is the experimental probability of rolling each number? Okay, now in theory, each number would be equally likely. So each number should have a one out of six chance in theory. Obviously, that's not what happened because certain numbers showed up more frequently than others. Well, first thing we should do is figure out how many total rolls we had. So all we're going to do there is just add together 42, 44, 45, 44, 47, and 46. We're going to have 230 total trials. From there, we take each occurrence, so the probability of rolling a 1 would be 42 divided by the total 230. The probability of rolling a 2 would be 44 out of 230. Probability of rolling a 3 would be 45 out of 230. Probability of rolling a 4 would be the 44 times that a 4 was rolled over the 230 total times. This continues for all of those numbers. Now, I have them written here as fractions. This problem is asking for decimals. So all we do is throw these into our calculator. Top number divided by 230 and round accordingly. All right, next step, a jar contains 20 red marbles. Nope, I can't read. 30 red marbles, 50 blue. So that's 80 so far, uh, 10 green, and 20 white. So all total, we have 110. So if I wanted to find the theoretical probability of each occurrence here, I would figure out the number of favorable outcomes over the total. So the probability I pick a red. Well, there are 30 red out of 110 total. That would be 30 over 110, and we would convert that to a decimal. So about 27%. The probability of not white, so all of them except for the white, I could go through and add 30 plus 50 plus 10, or if I know there's 110 total, and I know 20 of those are white marbles, I could just say, okay, well, 110 minus the 20, that's gonna give me 90 of them are not white. If 20 of them are, then the other 90 are not. So 90 over 110, and that would give me about 82%. And lastly, we have either red or blue. So between those two, I've got 30 reds, and I've got 50 blues. So between those two color combos, I've got 80 total. So 80 out of my total 110. As a decimal, that'd be about 73%. All right. Next up, a carnival game consists of throwing darts at a circular board as shown. What is the probability that a dart thrown at random, assuming you hit this board in general, but we don't know where on that board it'll hit, will hit the shaded region. Give your answer as a percent. So I need to know what is the area of just this shaded region, so this little ring. I need to know the area of just that ring, and then I'll divide that by the overall area, which is the area of that big circle. So there's two quantities I need to know. I need to know the area of the overall ring, and then I need to know the area of the entire circle. All right, so let's first get the, let's figure out the area of the ring. To calculate the area of the ring, we're gonna do the big circle minus the small circle. We're finding area, so those are pi r squared. That big circle had a radius of 3 and 5 together, so that would be a radius of 8. So the big circle has a radius of 8. And we're going to take away the radius or the area of the small circle, which is a radius of 3. So the area of the ring is going to be 64 pi minus 9 pi, that is 55 pi. The area of the big circle, well, that's just a straight up pi r squared, and we already know that that's 8 squared pi, 
So that's going to be 64 pi. When I do my division here, the pi's are going to cancel each other out. So really, I'm just figuring out what is 55 divided by 64. And that would be about 86%. So if we were to throw a dart at this dartboard, and we're guaranteed to at least hit the board, there's an 86% chance that it would land in that shaded region. All right, last example here. Got a batter strike zone, depends on the height and stance of the batter. What is the probability that a baseball thrown at random within the batter strike zone, as shown in the figure, will be a high inside strike? So we want to know, assuming that a ball gets thrown into here, what is the probability that we can get it into that little section? So I need the area of this little rectangle divided by the area of the entire rectangle. All right, so we're finding the area of the small rectangle divided by the total possible area. Well, fortunately, these are just rectangles, so we're doing some straight up length times width. Small rectangle is four and six, big rectangle is 22 and 17. So when I do my calculations here, up top that would be 24, and then if I divide it by the product of 22 times 17, I get about 6.4%. So pretty unlikely. Or if we're just keeping that as a decimal, that'd be 0 0.064. All right, that about sums it up for, oh, no, just kidding. That almost sums it up. Oh. We got one last example, yeah, and then we're done. All right. In a class of 147 students, that's our total. 95 are taking math, Ew. 73 are taking science, and 52 are taking both math and science. One student is picked, from, picked at random, find each probability. Now, when we do these, there's a specific pattern you're going to want to do to label. This is called a Venn diagram. Uh, first thing you're going to want to do is always start with the overlap. So in this case, our overlap was 52. So we want to plant our 52 there first. So we have 52 taking both. Let's handle that first. Now, if I look at the math circle, there's 95 total people taking math. Some of them are also taking science. That's cool, too. But 95 total people are in the circle. So if there's 52 here... There have to be 43 over here, so that way we get the total of 95. Same thing goes for the science, because in science we're expecting 73 total. We already know there's 52 here. That means we need 21 in this portion of the circle to total out to 73. Now this 31, this represents the students who are not taking math, nor are they taking science. They're taking neither one of these. And that comes from the fact that I know there are 147 students total. And if I were to add up 43 plus 52 plus 21, that's not going to get me the total 147. So I have to take whatever's left over there. In this case, it's 31. And that gets placed in that bottom right, broad, bah, bottom right hand corner. All right. So let's figure out the probability that we select a student who is not taking math. So a student that is not in this circle. Well, there's 21 here, there's 31 here, there would be 52 students not in that circle. So we'd have 52 over our total, which was 147. The probability we select a student who's taking math, so he's in the circle, but he's not taking science. So they have to be in the math circle, but not in the science circle. That would just be this 43 here. So we'd have 43 out of our total 147. And again, we would con uh, convert these to decimals as needed. And then lastly, what is the probability that a student is taking math or science or maybe both? So basically, they're somewhere in one of these circles. Well, there's 43, 52, and 21. Those are the numbers that are in one or both of those circles. And we have a total of 147. And again, we would simplify that out. All right. That just about does it now for experimental and theoretical probability. You know the drill, folks. If at any point you're stuck, please let me know. And as always, good luck. Have fun. Be safe. Roll Tide.